Bob Scully's World Show is made possible in part by GDI, Commercial Cleaning Services, one provider, one solution. And by Clocks Technologies, Biophotonic Lighting manages skin from within. Hi, this is Bob Scully and welcome to another edition of the World Show, the Free Markets Series. You're about to meet one of the most remarkable political thinkers and activists in North America today, a man who impresses everyone he meets, he'll impress you with his charisma, his conviction, his beliefs and his charm. And many people are starting to tout him as a future president one day. Democrat or Republican, Bob? Actually, neither. He's in his 20s, his name is Daniel DiMartino, and the country is Venezuela. Here he is. Daniel DiMartino, uh, you have written and spoken very eloquently about your childhood and your country, Venezuela. And I wanna to read today something that you wrote in, in, in USA Today. Um, but first, welcome to the show. Thank you. And here then is what you wrote in USA Today. The first time I couldn't buy food at the grocery store, I was 15 years old. It was 2014 in Caracas, Venezuela, and I had spent more than an hour in line waiting. When I got to the register, I noticed I'd forgotten my ID that day. Without the ID, the government rationing system would not let the supermarket sell my family the full quota of food we needed. It was four days until the government allowed me to buy more. This was fairly normal for me. All my life I had lived under socialism in Venezuela until I left and came to the United States as a student in 2016. Because the regime in charge imposed price controls and nationalized the most important private industries, production plummeted. No wonder I had to wait hours in line to buy simple products such as toothpaste or flour. And the shortages went far beyond the supermarket. My family and I suffered from blackouts and lack of water. The regime nationalized electricity in 2007 in an effort to make electricity free. Unsurprisingly, this resulted in underinvestment in the electrical grid. By 2016, my home lost power roughly once a week. A real horror story, and of course, nobody would want to live there, and indeed, many people are getting out. You got out, and that's quite the story. Tell us about that. How did you leave? I got out because I knew from a very young age that uh, I wanted to live in a place where I would have a chance to actually raise a family and live independently for myself. And I knew, unfortunately, Venezuela was not that place mm -hmm. uh, and was heading for worse, as it has. So I worked very hard to uh, you know, come to the United States. I studied for the SAT. I had good grades. I did a lot of extracurricular activities. And I applied for universities here, and I was very blessed to be admitted and then given a, a scholarship, basically full tuition plus my work uh, that allows me to be in Indianapolis, Indiana, where I where I study economics. And you make it sound, um, um, I mean, it is very positive, but you also make it sound easy when in fact I'm sure it was not easy. It was not, well, it was not, it was not. There's a lot of, it took years of planning. It took uh, a lot of effort and um, not everybody has that chance, which mm -hmm. is why we're seeing right now more than 4 million Venezuelans who have left. And there's people living and walking thousands of miles barefoot. Mm -hmm. that their, their feet are, are bleeding uh, because they have not even money to pay for the bus ticket to go to Colombia or, or any other country. And most people by now, I think, are familiar with, with the situation and the peculiar tragedy here. Venezuela, which is now one of the poorest countries in the world, was initially, before Chavismo, the, the richest country on that continent, thanks to the natural resources and the oil deposits and everything else. How could anybody blow that away so quickly? How did it happen? Look, Venezuela was a country that attracted millions of immigrants. My grandparents came from Italy and Spain after World War II and the Spanish Civil War, and they had nothing. They were extremely poor and they came by themselves at approximately the age that I had to leave Venezuela, which is around 19, and I left at 17. Um, 
and they immigrated to Venezuela because they were looking for a better future. And from not having anything, they built a middle-class family. They had their own businesses from absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the American dream in Venezuela. That's what it was through the 50s, 60s, up to the 70s, probably. And the country just went downwards after the government started intervening more in the economy. What's interesting and, and exceptional in your case as well um, is that you were speaking out already over there as a very young man. Um, and and um, before you went to Purdue, you were outspoken and clear about your opinions. Did you pay a price for that? Were you under surveillance? Were you being intimidated by students or authorities or anything like that? So in my school, um, I, I, w I was too young to be a political leader when I was in Venezuela. I left at 17. Um, I did get elected to like class president and I loved uh, doing, doing things and speaking out for mm -hmm. myself. I was always uh, that way. But I, and I went to protest, but I never was personally surveilled. The only thing that did happen to me was in the summer of 2017, when I went back to Venezuela, the last time I went back to visit my, my family before they fled, was um, that I went to visit my former high school. Mm -hmm. And there were protests going on around in the city and the National Guard started circling around my high school with uh, huge guns. Um, and in their motorcycles, in military, uh, you know, yeah, press, yeah, military garb. And they were basically threatening the kids if they got out of the school. You know, nobody got out of the school while the National Guard was around because we were afraid that they would just try to put us in jail for no reason. So, so there was intimidation? It was complete intimidation, yes. That's what they do. And in the interim, let's look at your folks. Um, you, while you were going this way, um, on the Caribbean, they were going that way over the Atlantic to Spain. They also fled. Your father had a gas station, in fact, and he left all that behind. Yes, my parents, what they did for a living was that they opened a gas station in 1999, 2000. That was at the beginning of uh, Chavez's uh, rule. Mm -hmm. And it was doing very well. Uh, it was with British Petroleum. It was a private, uh, you know, company. And um, my parents managed it. BP, of course, got a share of the, of the profit because they also put the infrastructure. And then Chavez nationalized it, nationalized BP, nationalized the oil industry in the country completely. And when he did that, uh, we started managing and obtaining all the profits of the, of the um, gas station. Mm -hmm. But because the government spent so much money in their welfare programs and hyperinflation went up so much, despite us having a greater share of the profit, we're making a lot less money uh, yeah, after, right. after inflation in, in purchasing power. So it was worse for us, the nationalization. One phenomenon that you explain very well in your texts, and we don't realize it, we read it, but it doesn't register when we hear the word hyperinflation. Uh, we think, yeah, okay, that's not good. But it's much, much worse than that. As you describe it, it's like a poison, like a cancer. As money loses it val its value and dwindles down to nothing, everybody suffers in all kinds of ways. Yeah, I, I could not fit enough money in my wallet to buy an empanada, mm -hmm. which is a typical food that people buy, like saying a sandwich here. Mm -hmm. uh, every day prices would change. And every week when I was still there, you'd see in the supermarket how things would increase 50%. Imagine something is, is you have to pay $10 for something today, it will cost $15 next week, and then $25, and then 35, yeah. and keep going up. And that's, that's hyperinflation. And as your father um, went over to Spain with your mom, uh, were they able to restart the same business, a, 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 another gas station? Unfortunately not. So my parents left. Uh, that was in December 2017. They left uh, to, to Madrid. They left with my grandparents, my uncle, my aunt. And we, we went there. They, uh, after they sold everything, they just rented an apartment. They rented a, um, like a local mm -hmm. uh, business. And they started a, a small restaurant where they sell food, especially catering and things like that. So they were still quite uh, entrepreneurial. They are very entrepreneurial. They're very entrep That's something that I didn't notice at first throughout my life. But because we never talked about about being entrepreneurial in specific. Mm -hmm. But now that I look back at what they have done throughout their lives, and now that I talk to them, I tell them, you, you were almost all your lives uh, your own business owners, you know? Mm -hmm. You started from nothing, and that's what they did. So it's definitely the symbol of the free market, what they do. And, and you too, of course, are quite entrepreneurial. You're, you're sought after as a speaker, as a columnist. 
um, despite your studies and, and, and your, your age. Um, you're gaining enormously in credibility and you make things happen. Um, the mock uh, United Nations uh, Parliament um, with the 196 members, I know you had your reservations about the UN, but you still were tasked with building that and you did, it worked. So what I did was in my university, we did not have a mall United Nations uh, club that would allow us to participate in competitions that happen nationwide and worldwide. Uh, you know, this Mall United Nations is an activity that started at Harvard, uh, at least that's what the official story says, in, after World War II. Mm -hmm. And um, it's been very successful since then, and that's something I did in Venezuela myself as well when I was a kid. Yeah. And when I went to my university and saw we didn't have one, I started the club, and uh, it's now very successful. It's in the top 75 of North America. Uh, of, co of colleges and universities, so we're doing well, and I'm very proud and happy for that. Not, I'm not the president anymore of the club, but it's it's doing well. And and to look at uh, at a paradox here um, that occurs um, more frequently than we think with major dictators is that they're very incompetent. They're poor at their job of dictatorship, so to speak. Um, after all, a guy like Chavez could have said, "Well, I've got all this oil wealth. I can have as much of it as I want." I can have yachts, I can have uh, uh, palaces, I can have any kind of luxury that I deserve and uh, want, and people will still have to obey me and worship me and so forth. Um, he could have done all that and left the rest of the country alone, really. Um, but he had to blow it all away with cult of the personality, ridiculous red shirts that everybody wore, and so forth. Why would he do that? I think that there's two theories around this, and I'm still not sure which is right. I think that one of those theories is that they really believe in, in full socialism and they believe that um, because of the resentment of or experiences that they have had in their lives, they think that they have the right to take away somebody else's property mm -hmm. and they think that that will work, but of course it hasn't and then they just blame it on whichever other external costs such as blackouts or because of an iguana or right-wing <laughs> sabotage. It's not a joke. I mean, they have actually said that an iguana ate a cable many times, <laughs> and that's why there are blackouts in the country. Um, so that's one of the theories, and I think that's true for many of within people within the regime. And then the other theory is that they need to stay in power, and the only way to stay in power is to bribe the mm -hmm. military and bribe uh, terrorist groups and bribe drug dealing groups, which they have set up. And the only way to establish those bribes and stay in power is by cheating in elections, by making people submissive. How do you make them more submissive than by making them do hours of lines to buy their own food and Dependent, only worry yeah. about food, not protest or democracy? And, and Chavez, um, in addition to a, a lot of his ridiculous cult of the personality and so on, uh, was not above making similarly spectacular, stupid decisions uh, to attract attention, like that, that famous example. I'm reaching back here, but years ago, Venezuela controlled Sitgo indirectly, I believe, and Congressman Kennedy had complained that the people of Massachusetts were not getting all the heating oil they needed in the winter, and Chavez appears on the scene and says, here, take my oil. Uh, and, and of course, it didn't work. He didn't really mean it, and it wasn't doable, but he got some publicity out of it. Um, that's the way he thought. Yes, he, he was known for giving away our own resources to other countries. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was just a publicity stunt that he did, uh, giving away a little oil to the U.S. Uh, for free. But uh, actually, the U.S. was the main uh, partner that bought Venezuelan oil until recently uh, and actually paid because all the other countries that buy our oil, quote unquote, they actually just get it for free. Cuba gets it for free. China gets it as a form of debt repayment. And then Chavez and Maduro currently give oil for free to Caribbean islands with yeah. the purpose of buying their uh, diplomacy. And, and uh, let's not forget Russia. And Russia. Chavez had, had uh, as, as a benefactor, Russia, and then he was trying to help out Cuba. So Chinese, Russian, and Iranian uh, oil, state-owned oil companies are the ones that are mostly operating in the Orinoco belt. They are the ones that are extracting our oil. So when they talk about imperialism or that the U.S. is imperialistic in Venezuela, the only countries that are really being imperialistic and taking away another country's mm -hmm. resources for free are Iran, Russia, China, and Cuba, not the and, U.S. And there's another paradox at, at work here. Um, Chavez, in an odd way, uh, who admired supposedly Castro, may have helped to bring down the Castro mystique because um, Castro, uh, before that, 
had sort of an impe impeccable image in some quarters as a glorious revolutionary. Along comes Chavez, who's kind of a buffoon, uh, who's kind of the joke version uh, of, of the same thing. And people see through it right away. Um, and they say, you know, this guy's not, not serious. Um, but then they also say he's another Castro. And it, it reflected on Castro, I think, oddly enough. And, and in, an, in an odd way, uh, it helped to bring down the Castro statue. I think it might have happened. I think that Chavez had um, very, as, as you were saying, a, a huge personal cult around the country. Mm -hmm. He, uh, unfortunately, he wanted to make it all about him. They, they even made rosaries with his face, a complete sacri you know, completely sacrilegious uh, of, of Catholicism. And he, he wanted just power for himself, and he died uh, you know, in power uh, yeah. of cancer, and he was so sure that he was gonna co keep control of the country even after dying, that he left somebody he picked himself in national TV, which is Maduro. Mm -hmm. which is, the whole reason Maduro is there is because Chavez hadn't picked him. Uh, a lot of dictators do that, try to name their successor. That's right. And again, if we compare with, with, with Cuba, um, the exiles, the resistance, so to speak, who went to Florida, uh, they had to wait decades for, for that change. Um, in, in the case of Venezuela, could the same thing happen? Yes, it's happening. Uh, so there are about 500, 600,000 Venezuelans in the United States right now. According to the U.S. Census, if you just make uh, projections based on what the new visas are, that are issued and the arrivals and the uh, poll data from mm -hmm. the census. And there's over 4 million Venezuelans that have escaped in the last few years only around the world. Mm. This is a country of 30 million people, so that means that it's about 12, 15% mm -hmm. of our population left within a few years. And uh, Brookings and other institutions in the U.S. have projected that there could be even up to 10 million Venezuelan refugees by the end of 2021 or 2020. Um, this is a huge humanitarian crisis. Like people are dying trying to escape from our country. People are dying because of lack of medicine, because of lack of food, and because of huge crime rates. You know, where my city, Caracas, where I lived, had, still has the highest murder rate in the world. Hmm. I didn't know that. Yes. And um, another thing dictators do, of course, and dictatorships, um, when they're brutal enough, is they start to identify and surveil their own citizens abroad and target them. Are you afraid for your safety? I, I, I've been, uh, I only do it and I only speak because my parents are not in Venezuela and most of my family is not either. Mm -hmm. So that's what makes me, you know, at least more calm. Uh, of course, there's still risks and there's people who have been kidnapped and there's people who get killed and targeted by the regime. Um, but if I don't do it, that I, that I have most of my family abroad, then who's gonna uh, yeah. speak out, you know? You've been described to me as one of the most dynamic students on, on the Purdue campus. Obviously you are, um, and therefore you have a great American future in front of you if you want it, and maybe a great Venezuelan future in front of you if events allow. So which would you pick? I, I think that if Venezuela, if we were able to take freedom to for Venezuela, you know, a democracy, uh, I would be very happy to, to go back, and that's what I would love to do. And I would love to find my, my friends there and my family and go there. Um, but if not, I love the United States. And I think the United States is an amazing country founded upon the freedoms that I believe in, mm -hmm. and w which is why I came to the United States and nowhere else. I've noticed as well that you take positions uh, in writing or, or um, in, in speeches. You take positions on American issues as well. For instance, um, privatization of public lands and so on. Um, and therefore, you must get some flack uh, on the American side when you, when you do that uh, and you become a part of the American political debate. Yes, um, so I am a very uh, you know, outspoken uh, person for free markets. I consider that um, the reason that Venezuela went uh, to this terrible path and the reason countries usually go through hyperinflation, so the countries go mm -hmm. through higher poverty, unemployment, not even extreme situations, but bad economic conditions are usually caused because of government interventions. 
And in the United States, there are examples of how the government is messing up with people's lives. There's mm -hmm. plenty of examples. Mm -hmm. You see it in the veterans healthcare system, where uh, it's the only system that is actually government healthcare, like in other countries. And it is the worst system <laughs> in the United States, where mm -hmm. veterans have died in line, where there's so many scandals, a waste of money. And it happens because the government is there. And it's the same, you know, the postal system. The government owns a huge share of the land in this country that has no productive use. It's not even, many of it is not even for environmental purposes. And that could easily be sold for a lot of money yeah, too. Yeah, incredible. Yeah. And do you fraternize with your fellow uh, Venezuelans here? Uh, is it like the Cubans who do tend to stick together or more like the Mexicans or the Argentinians who are sort of mixed in in the population? Um, which is it? What do you prefer? It, it is, I would say that there is a Venezuelan community and people do get excited. I get excited when I meet other Venezuelans. And there's now Venezuelans everywhere. You know, I know Venezuelans in Indiana and I know Venezuelans in DC and I know Venezuelans in Miami. And every time, I recently actually got a text from somebody that I knew from many years ago in Venezuela mm. that met a common American friend in Missouri. And she texted me, hey, I met uh, your friend uh, and in this conference and he told me that he knows you from Venezuela. And then I remember that I was in a mall United Nations with you in Caracas and now we're connected. And yeah, people, I get excited and I think we have a very uh, tight community. Looking at the, at the positives now, um, assuming you, you can't go back and, uh, and, and therefore you don't, uh, let's look at your American future. In a few years, and you, you stay here, in a few years, where will you be? What will you be doing? Well, my goal would be to become an American citizen. So right now I'm, I'm still in college and I graduate actually in December, so very mm -hmm. soon. Uh, I plan to work then until July and get a PhD in economics uh, and then working in the think tank world and uh, advocating for freedom for Venezuela and advocating for freedom anywhere around the world. I think that that's the best work that we can do because we have freedoms here in the United States that are amazing, and I think that everybody should be able to enjoy those freedoms. I think that it is the true human right, mm -hmm. the huge human right, is that people need to be free to pursue their own dreams. And, and here, all they have to do is read the Constitution because it's, it's for real. That's right, and that's why we need to protect freedom in this country too, and that's also part of what I do. And how do you deal then uh, with the skeptics? Because there's always, in any political debate, that's part of democracy. Um, some people will, will not believe you and, and will not share in your optimism and, and, and will heckle you or whatever. How do you deal with the skeptics? Well, I, I think that it is very common to find people who support um, kind of social democrat policies. And that's, and that's perfectly fair, a fair position to have. I think that what it is important is that people need to acknowledge the costs of those policies mm -hmm. and understand that, yes, the United States could transition into things like a single payer healthcare system, but what's the cost of that? Are you willing to bear that cost? I don't think American society, I don't think the overwhelming majority of Americans are willing to pay for the cost of those policies, yeah. which are wrong in my view. And of course, there, there's two sides to every coin. Um, in the case of, of public debate here, um, there are um, pe people who, who will say, well, the right does its thing, the left does its thing, uh, but it's all very predictable and partisan and, and not very fruitful and, and kind of boring. Uh, others will say, no, 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 that's, that's the way it should be. This is really an outstanding place. Um, where do you come down? Uh, where do I come down on? Uh, on democracy, how it's practiced here. Is it vital and, and, and full of life, um, or is it routine? No, well, I would say that perhaps I, I'm too young to tell you if it, it's been repetitive too much, mm -hmm. but uh, I would say that democracy is completely, you know, it's the best system that, that we have and it's excellent. Um, the media definitely has problems and there's a lot of um, false things being said, but I think that the United States has a perfectly healthy democracy that we need to uh, keep that way, we need to, especially with free speech. Uh, if we start censoring, if we start as, you know, either on mm -hmm. social media or on TV, then we won't be able to have the discourses that we need. And uh, don't laugh, um, but somebody who's observed you for some time with admiration told me the other day, this kid, if he sticks with it, you're part of the Vente movement, uh, which is growing, you're an important part of it. Um, if that movement grows and he grows with it, um, he will eventually, despite his young age, be a young president of his country. 
What do you say? Hey, I say that if we have democratic elections in Venezuela in a very distant future, uh, because I'm too young definitely to even, you know, run there, um, I would say that, you know, it's something that I, I might consider, I'm not sure. Uh, I think that Venezuela is a country with an amazing future with freedom, mm -hmm. and any way in which I could help to, to do it, I would. I'm not interested, and it's not my goal. Um, I think that there's other capable people in my party that uh, are definitely better positioned to do that at this moment. A lot of people have said exactly that and have become president of their country. Uh, you're yeah. right, you're right, you never know, you never know. Uh, so <laughs> my party, uh, Vente Venezuela, they are the only free market, true free market party that supports privatizing the oil industry, mm -hmm. that we support a hard stance against Maduro and because we acknowledge that the Venezuelan conflict won't be solved through negotiation, unfortunately, yeah. because we have no leverage against the dictator. So we acknowledge those things, and we have an amazing leader in Maria Corina Machado that um, is, is gonna go far. And, and you too, I might add. And Daniel, um, I can't vote for you, I'm not allowed, um, but if you do get that far, and by God, I, I hope you do, um, we can at least, I'm sure, have lunch uh, together in Caracas. Definitely, definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Danielle DiMartino was our guest this week on the Free Markets series of The World Show. I'm Bob Scully. Have a great week. Thanks. Bob Scully's World Show was made possible in part by GDI. Commercial cleaning services, one provider, one solution. And by Clocks Technologies. Biophotonic lighting manages skin from within.